Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Depression Chamber number three. It's been about eight months, or maybe even nine months, since the last one. So much like a a, a human baby's gestation period, we have birthed a new Depression Chamber. I don't even know if anybody's here, but that's okay, because it seems a lot of people have been watching these in the video catalog. I've been getting a lot of comments on these videos from nine months ago asking me to do another one. So in case you don't know, this is a series where hundreds of people have emailed me their stories about their battles with depression and loneliness and in just negative feelings. And I just have hundreds of emails in my inbox from last year, paragraph long stories about these things. And uh, what I do on this show, I don't really talk to the chat. I just read these stories. There's not really any reason why these are live, but I guess some people prefer a live show. So with that being said, I don't even know. I don't know if uh, super chat is enabled on this account, but don't don't send any super chat. Don't. You guys can talk to each other in the chat, but uh, I'm going to be focused on an entirely different thing. Just reading these stories, I might not even respond to all of the emails. Usually, I would try to give some really shitty um, armchair psychologist you, you're telling people, "Oh, well, I I understand." How you... Nah, tonight I'm just gonna fucking read them. And of course, everybody is going to remain anonymous. So here's one from Mr. C M. And also, I'm very tired and uh, somewhat buzzed tonight. So if you can't tell, <laughs> let's hope I don't fall asleep during the stream. Mr. CM, I have felt a strange nothingness all my life, and I don't know whether it's depression, autism, sociopathy, or something else entirely. I, re I rarely feel any real emotion for longer than five minutes a day. The only time when I have grieved for something was when I had a cat, and even then it lasted for seven hours. I was raised in a single mother household. My mom gave birth to me at the age of 15 and only kept me around as free money from the government and as a punching bag for when she felt bad about her shitty life. Every day wasn't very good. I got beat by her nearly every week. My earliest memory is having a table thrown at my head by her when I was four. She strangled me when I was seven and poured piss on me when I was nine. I was called nothing all, all my life by her and that no matter how hard I tried, I would never succeed in anything I try. She had boyfriends. They treated me a bit better, but as time went on, she bought out the, she bought out the worst in those people too, and eventually she had two children with one of them. I grew to despise my brother and sister. They were treated like they were perfect, and they figured out uh, that, and they figured that out eventually. They are five years younger than I am. I frequently had the things I held precious to me broken or stolen by them, mainly video games slash consoles. And if I tried to do anything, I was beaten by my mother for it. Eventually, when I was 14, I couldn't stand my brother enough that I tried to strangle him to death, but my mother walked in and I was kicked out and sent to live with my grandma until I was 18. Those were the most notable memories of my childhood, but I could be incorrect, as a lot of it I have blocked out by now. As soon as I turned 18, my grandma told me to pack my bags as I was being forced to move back in with my mom. I would have objected, but uh, but by that time, I was a 290-pound shut-in who did not have any way to make money, so I just gave up and moved back in. My life improved somewhat due to having a PC, and now that I was 18, I, be I became considered an adult, meaning as long as I contribute most of my money to bills slash food shopping, I get my own room, internet, and one meal a day. I currently don't know what to do with my life to improve it. I am slowly losing weight due to not eating much, but I'm completely unfit for any form of work due to past incidents, incidents involving me trying to stab a friend in the neck with a pen. I was put on a list, and any person who is hiring will see that. I have zero friends offline due to, due to not leaving the house and zero friends online due to my lack of knowing how to communicate with others in a normal manner or even where to meet and talk to others due to me not using any form of social media. I know as soon as I fix one of the issues I have, the will always, uh, the will always be more and more and more. I am gay, 
yet weigh so much nobody will find me attractive. Hell, I wouldn't touch me with a 20-foot metal pole. I have no interesting qualities, and I'm just a downer of a person to be around, as you can probably tell from this letter. I have attempted suicide at least three times now, and all have proven unsuccessful. I live in England, so I have no way of shooting myself. I tried all forms of therapy, self-help, or whatever else, as generally as I don't think anyone would or could understand the, spe the, specific, de uh, the specific situation I am in slash have been in all my life. Sorry for this long ranty thing that probably makes no sense. I hope you get some use out of it or something. And that's the end of that email. Uh, we have another one that says, uh, it's from uh, IH. IH says, if you came across another email I sent to you with the same story, read this one instead. This one has a short but important detail edited. Uh, Yo, Mumkey, I heard about your depression chamber stream, so I thought I'd send you my story. Here it is. And I hope I didn't read this on a previous episode, um, but if I did, then whatever. Who can remember from nine months ago? By the beginning of the second semester of my grade 12 year of high school, I finally felt like I could accomplish things my past self wouldn't be able to. I thought that my future was soon going to be a bright one, but that wasn't the case. Later on in the semester, my father announced that he was getting married the day after my 18th birthday. He probably meant well by this, but I was still sort of pissed that I would have to spend my day of entering adulthood celebrating my father getting married. I started to, no I started to notice more depressed thoughts after this but it was only the beginning of my downward spiral into dark thoughts. Later, I discovered that my cat had a deadly tumor in her jaw. I had this cat since I was four years old, so I had a strong emotional connection to this cat. A couple of weeks later, my cat had to finally be put down. That day, I cried more tears than I had ever had in my life. I didn't know how I was going to deal with it. It was then I thought, that I had to finally collect the courage to ask out a girl that I had feelings for more than over a year, just so I could experience something nice in return for losing my cat. I had hesitated to ask her out for several reasons, not just because I was a pussy. In the same week my cat died, I had asked this girl out only to find out that I was a day or two late. She already accepted an offer for a date from a guy that she didn't have many feelings for. That weekend, I didn't feel like doing anything, not even fapping, and I thought about ways I could end myself. Fortunately, I was seeing a close friend of mine that weekend, but waiting to meet up with him had never been harder. For the first time, I was afraid of what I might do to myself if he didn't show up soon. When he did show, I felt a sense of relief, but I still didn't feel completely well, even though he was there. When it was time for him to leave, I was actually scared. That night, I was scared what I might do to myself the next day, since, since I had that day all to myself. To my surprise, I felt kind of okay the next day, but fast forward some weeks later, and things were clearly not okay. I found myself walking into the kitchen and picking up a knife. I started running it along my fingers until I came to my senses, realizing what I was doing. I then retreated to my room and started crying. I admitted to my mother about what I, had, what I was going to do to myself, and then she hid all of the sharp knives in the kitchen from me. Things got better after that, but I'm still haunted by dark thoughts now and then. In fact, I think it's possible that I may have a, a mild case of bipolar, but I don't know for sure. I will still think of myself as a failure of a human being now and then and want to commit acts of self-harm, but sometimes I'm fine. There are still events in my life that make things a bit tougher for me. My mother almost threatened my father to send her history of court cases with him to his fiance, which includes things like accusations of rape and whatnot. That almost put me in another episode of depression since I didn't want to deal with that stress. Anyways, I'm going to university with a very blurry picture of my future right now, which I do not like. I am someone who usually has their life figured out, but with so many complications, it's hard to focus on that. And that's the end of the email. What I uh, just sort of realized as I was reading that is since all of these emails are from back in August of 2017, there's a mild chance, I mean, given what happened from my short film contest, 
there's a mild chance that some of these emails might be from dead people, which is pretty fucked to think about. Um, so we, we might be reading some form of suicide letters here today, folks. And I'm just going to peek in on the chat to make sure my mic's actually working. Um, yeah, it looks like it's fine. We got Spicy Salts just asking people what shoe he should buy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, here's an email from JJ. Dear Mumkey, I'm writing to you to share my experiences with extreme social anxiety and possible depression. Ever since I was a kid, I've had issues socializing. I feel extremely sick whenever I try to make a conversation with someone and sometimes spend nights just thinking of what I'm going to say. Seriously, I used to plan out what I was going to say in class during high school and college. I was so insecure about my ability not to make an arse out of myself, I ended up not talking at all, making myself a social outcast. I believe that the cause of this anxiety is from bullying when I was a kid. From the age of 5 to 14, I never had a proper friend. All the so-called friends I made in this time either backstabbed me or moved away, which leads me to have severe trust issues. Also during this time in school, I was not doing well. I would find out later in life that I had ADD and that, and that would contribute to why I wasn't able to concentrate. But I would be constantly berated by for not being able to concentrate. I also have dyslexia and have had teachers from kindergarten to high school bully me over my handwriting. Both of my issues, ADD and dyslexia, have caused me to fall behind, and I only ever caught up in the last year of high school, even then. I got average grades and constantly torment myself over what could have been. If my teachers had caught on to the fact that I had these two disorders, maybe I could have gotten the help I needed. Maybe I could have gone on to be an engineer or a doctor. But no, I'm stuck with average grades and have many, many doors closed to me. The thing which pains me the most about this is that subconsciously I blame myself for everything. I have to take the blame for all of this. It's not that my teachers didn't do their job. It's that I'm a failure. It's that I'm dumb. It's that I didn't notice it at first. Even though I was a kid who couldn't know, I blame myself deep down, which has made me completely lose my self-esteem. I find it hard to try new things because of this voice in the back of uh, my head telling me, you're a failure. You failed, and you failed before and you'll fail again. I mean this in a metaphorical sense. I don't have schizophrenia. But this nagging feeling in the back of my mind causes me to devalue myself time and time again. It causes me to feel like utter shit, and it causes me to hate the world. It makes me to resent the world and lash out at those who have done nothing wrong. The number one thing which annoys me, though, is that if I try to get help for this, I'll probably put on millions of meds. Or maybe put in a loony bin. It sickens me at how awfully mental health is treated in society, and that there are so many out there like myself who can't do anything about it without being treated as some insane person, someone who needs to be constantly medicated and can't think for themselves. With all of this in mind, I am recovering. I've been having fewer panic attacks. I've been able to think more positively in life and have found a career I want to do, and more importantly, can do. But that does not excuse how shit the system we all have to go through, wherever it be medical or educational. Thanks for reading my letter. It's probably far-fetched and a bit vapid, but I hope you'll get the message I am trying to convey. Yours sincerely, Jay. I got some people in the chat confused. Uh, read the description, folks. I am reading emails that people sent me about their battles with depression. It's not that complicated. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that hard to follow. Okay, here's a new one. Oh boy, this one's pretty long. From Mr. TD. <sighs> TD writes, I go a bit off topic and am a little too positive about this maybe. Well, I guess we could use a little bit of positivity, huh? My story is pretty similar to most of these losers here. 
I'm super into internet subcultures and love entertainment media more than my life, probably. For a long time from along the start of my adolescence, I had a lot of disillusions that spawned from the questions that you're taught to just not think about it here because it's too far removed. Needless to say, entertainment media definitely was my source of armchair uh, philosophy. South Park and Evangelion shaped much of the structures of the questions and answers. A lot of that thinking happened during my wait timers at home. Basically, my brother privatized the PC a lot, but I was obsessed with the stuff I wanted to watch and play. So I waited and waited and took every opportunity to watch, read, or bookmark something during my brother's breaks. This continued for a long time. The wait timers were pretty self-destructive, but I did create a lot of story scenarios and continued those all the way to university. My mind wandering to a separate story where I manipulate everything. I dare to say my stories were cool, but I could never put them into words or written form. I tried recently while trying to write JoJo-style fan fiction. I'm not past the first fight, but my mind is already so far ahead. I'll never end it. I dabbled into giving up on hard questions, giving into religious answers and stuff. Well, that didn't last long, and neither did my social life in school. These two are slightly tied, but more importantly, I was a Narutard. I searched and found and screenshotted and learned Photoshop just to create a personal database of all the jutsus and their respective hand seals. I knew all their names and used Japanese interjections like Kuso for shit and stuff of this sort IRI. Uh, I ninja run my ninja run was awful as well. I was really bad at girls still am slightly better though. I had this one girl in the last few years of high school that lives my suburbia practically a neighbor, but we never talked, never hung out. We never saw e each other super often on the way back and stuff, but I was too lazy and shy to do anything about it. She could have been a good friend. Talked to her this summer when she came back from her abroad university. She's cool. Too late, though. I had a few good friends. We had good times and, rare, and really shit times. Half of them are abroad now, following their dreams, and I'm super glad for them. I made up my mind a long time ago that I'll support my friends even if they leave and will see each other super rarely. Too bad that it makes it super hard to actually be friends. My personality, I came to the real... I, I came to the realization recently that it's super obsessive. I find something. I obsess over it for thousands of hours. One time my brother found a cool Magicka Let's Play of the Yogg's cast. About three years after that, I was still religiously watching everything a lot of channels produced, especially Minecraft. League of Legends, that too is something I obsessed super, super hard about, especially during the boom of the League of Legends YouTube video making sub subculture around 2013. I was and still am completely directionless, directionless, in, directionless in life, even after attending two really lazy years of accounting university. I claim to want to be a programmer, a trend analyst, a cook, an accountant, an organizer, a video editor, a blogger slash YouTuber, but I am still in the embryo stage of all of those. I want to learn an instrument. I want to live abroad. I want to have one night stands and disposable relationships. I claim all of those, but I have no idea of how to achieve anything. That lack of direction, the intensity of which culminated after I finished school, led me to a deep depression that, I, that made me want to, to super die. I had the death wish for a long time. I flirted with the idea, searched for methods, thought up plans to make it fast and painless. I came to the conclusion that I want to die at some point, but I'll live to have fun and stuff. My conclusion is basically that I postpone my suicide until living conditions are trash, fuck living as an old vegetable or with illnesses, and are unchangeable. Before that, in the super sad summer of 2013, I think, I had a super close encounter with death. I lost a league game and was super frustrated. Thinking about that lack of direction and how I'm worthless, I went to feed my dogs and found a long wire and a wooden roof skeleton that used and used that as a hanging place. Literally no one would have stopped me. I was free to die. 
The second I stepped from my wooden support, I felt the wire fucking choking me super hard, and I somehow fit my hands in the noose to stop myself. I cried a lot that day. Nowadays, I feel as if every bad feeling I have is self-manufactured, that my feelings are artificial and stuff. I think that's because I try to rationalize everything I and every interaction in some way or another for creating more mind stories. The point is I cannot help questioning the validity of my negative thoughts and feelings. I don't know if this qualifies as depression or some kind of emotional dissociation, but from what I heard on the first episode, I'm not the only one to have this. That's about it, I think. It's it's disjointed, stupid, and long, but I hope someone will read it and be comforted that someone is shittier at life than him slash her. By the way, cold showers and exercise, at least stretching and taking walks, really helps with depression. And that's the end of that email. All right. Let's go to a story from Noel Noel. I guess uh, that's not their real name, I assume, unless their parents really hated them. <laughs> from Noel Noel. Hi, Monkey. I never checked this email, so if you respond, sorry, I'll never know. Well, there you go. This is more of a confession chamber than a depression chamber, since I'm semi-depressed but never been suicidal, more just incredibly lonely all my life. So I've always lied to my parents and done things behind their back. I stole money from my mom's friend's wallet once while he was in the bathroom, stuff like that. I was young, though. One time, I think I was nine or so, I was at my friend's house, and somebody said they could see a girl who was there's panties. She immediately pulled her skirt down, but I wanted to see them too. So I chased her around the house until she told her parents. And then my mom came and got me and took me home. That's the first inkling of my borderline rapist stories. I had a girlfriend in high school who I really, really liked, but anytime we were kissing or I was touching her boobs, I'd always be trying to get uh, her to go farther. If she said no enough times, I'd stop and feel horribly guilty afterwards, but I would go farther than she wanted to, I know. I guess that's kind of been the thing with my whole life, is I've felt guilty about so many things. I've kind of taken my guilt and pride as a way to learn from my mistakes, but I need to confess these stories at some point. The really bad one that happened is a year ago when I was 16. I was sleeping over at a friend of my mother's. She had a daughter who was 12 years old and who, when we were in elementary school, had a crush on me. A few months earlier, we had gotten together and watched anime together, and she got in a position behind me so I could rest my head on her boobs. She didn't seem to mind too much, but I think she was just flattering me. But anyway, so I was staying a few nights at her house, and her mom was gone, and we were seeing who was stronger she was. So we were wrestling and stuff like that, and she had me pinned down and was like, haha, I won. I was getting kind of aroused at this point, so I asked her what she was going to do since she won. She started pinching me and tickling me, which was kind of hot. I told her if she wanted to keep me pinned down and tickle me more, she should tie me up, which she did. Uh, she didn't realize what she was doing at the time, I think, but I was very aroused by it. I feel so much shame for taking advantage of the situation for sexual pleasure, no less with a barely pubescent child. I don't think I'm a pedophile since I'm not attracted to children in general and I don't fab to lowly porn or anything, but that does not excuse that I, at 16 years old, was being given sexual pleasure by someone three-fourths my age. Anyway, so that was night one. Night two, we did truth or dare. <sighs> And I wanted her to dare me to do something dirty, but she wouldn't. She always did truth, though. In my thirsty and etc. Et state, I asked her if she had masturbated before. Perfectly normal question to ask for truth or dare with someone who wasn't 12. She started to get grossed out, and I'm not sure if she realized what had been going on before, but she started to avoid me more. 
I was frustrated that she wouldn't talk to me. So while she and her mother were out of the house, I masturbated in her bed to get back at her. The third day, we barely spent any time together, and I marathoned an anime I liked and tried to excuse what I had been doing. It's been a year since then, but I'm still masturbating to the thought of her, even though I haven't seen her in such a long time. Again, to emphasize, I'm not really attracted to any other children, and the attractive qualities of her are that she's an early bloomer and has boobs and everything else, but it makes me question whether or not I have pedophilic, pedophilic tendencies, not to mention the rapey tendencies. I'm worried that in the future I won't be able to control myself and I will actually rape someone, especially because I haven't had a girlfriend in three years now. So yeah, that's my confession story. I can do a life story later to explain why I've been so fucking lonely for so long, but that's all. Thank you for listening to me and letting me tell someone thing. Normally I'm pretty open about bad things I've done, but this crossed a line that I felt like I had to bury it down from everyone. And that's the end of that email. Wow. That's, uh, you know what? That's almost more entertaining than a depression story. We should have more people send in their deepest, darkest confessions. Because uh, that was uh, a fucking thrill ride of what the fuck. Okay, let's uh, let's see if the next one's any better. We've got... Um, okay, here's one from SF. SF says, Monkey Jones, in your videos, you've mentioned how to distract yourself to help deal with depression. But the main time when you have problems with it is when you're awake in the night trying to sleep. I hope that my advice can help you with this issue and ease your troubles with depression by the off chance that no one else has suggested this advice. As someone who once greatly suffered from info overload, overload and clinical depression, which I take prescriptions for, to the point of getting headaches. I tried mindfulness meditation to ease my thoughts, and it helped me a lot once I started getting used to it. According to the conscious competence model and, and the law of practice, any new skill at first will seem forced and unnatural as you start, but with repeated practice, it will eventually become instinctive and natural. As this technique worked for me, the same could be applied to your problem. It's certainly worth a try, or two or three until it becomes natural. It could also help you drift off to sleep more easily as your body and mind's more relaxed state eases you into sleep faster. Also, try reading to sleep, something boring. They say that it works and it will distract you from your thoughts. One more thing, you said you also have constant ideas for making videos going through your head, which can drive you insane. Again, my info overload applies here too, so I always keep a blank notepad doc open, a memo pad, or a phone on me, and jot down my thoughts as fast as I can. What this does is clear my mind and eliminate the stress and need of having to remember something before I forget it. This should help you if you don't do this already. Hope this helps. Yours truly, Jumpy Moans x Diddy Kong. Okay, well, advice from Jumpy Moans x Diddy Kong. And I lost my place in the emails. Let's see if I can find those again. Got to dig all the way back to August of last year. There we go. Let's see how the folks in the chat are doing. Looks like they're doing fine. <laughs> Don't know what they're talking about. They're just all saying.
Looks like my mic cut off for a while. Thankfully, Sheep overcame it and warned me. My uh, my shitty Blue Yeti always uh, likes to turn itself off. I would not recommend this mic. So I'll, I'll wait for everybody to realize I'm back. It's hard to keep an eye on it, too, because you have the the pop filter in front of the mic. So then you can't see if the red light is on. Anyway, I don't know where I left off. So I'll just start this email over. Sorry about that, folks. I guess the sheep over will have to come in and let me know because I'm not keeping my eye on the chat. Kiss the mic for your fans. There you go. Okay, we'll start that over from Pleb Weeb. Hello, dear monkey. I see that your depression chamber extraordinaire is up. Here's my experience. I hope that will do. Thanks for reading. It's 2.30 a.m. in EU land, and I've not done anything creative or fulfilling in a long, long time. Perhaps I'm writing this email because I perceive it as some kind of outlet for my mental issues. It's not as if I had anyone to talk about it. I want to be an artist. Stuck in my room, I just watch and watch video upon video and play video games. I've been doing this for two years now. I watch, I play, I read sometimes. I ordered your book, Monkey. It better be good shit. I take notes. I truly appreciate things of things that I'd like to do, that I'd like to write, to draw, whatever. Because I want to live to inspire others and to find some more beauty somewhere in this sad reality. To be an artist, a successful one, a failed one, whatever. That's what I want to do, to be a guy that lives by his art, whatever that means. Because no other job can satisfy me. The thing is, I suck at being an artist. It's purely by lack of trying. I never get started. I don't even get to see if I'm good or bad. The best time to plant a tree is 50 years ago, I heard. The second best time is right now. Why not start right now, then? Nothing can stop me. I have all the free time in the world. I have the money, the ideas, the inspiration, everything. There's literally nothing else I want to do when I look at the bigger picture. I just can't. It's such a hassle. To do anything that hasn't been programmed into my brain by habit, and every day when I do this, I just want to lay down somewhere and die quietly. I feel stuck. Um, I feel stuck. It's weird. I need help. I needed help 50 years ago, but I don't want it. I want to lay down and die. And yet there's still hope or something. When I see stuff that you do, for example, you're depressed too, but you do things. You do art. You inspire me. It is possible. So I go on. The fridge paradox. There it is. That's how I see depression. Every night I find myself in front of this white box filled to the brim with food I'd love to taste, sustenance that I need, yet I can't pick anything. Not because I'm not hungry, not because I can't, but because I don't feel like it. I should eat, I'm starving, but I have. I should have a balanced meal or something, something that a fucking normie would enjoy. But I just don't want to go through the hassle of cooking whatever fucking dish. So I just grab the bag of chips and eat my fill like an animal, indulging in immediate satisfaction before crawling back to my room and closing my eyes full of regret. I wish I could just decide someday to either start cooking or starve to death. Someday, perhaps. Subscribe to Monkey Jones. Thanks for listening. Somebody in the chat says, sheep over, please date Mumkey. I want my ship to happen. Why do you think we live together? <laughs> do you think we just live together as, uh, <laughs> as fucking friends? <laughs> okay, let's go to the next one. Yeah, me and my platonic female friend and I just uh, happen to live together. <laughs> Uh, let's see. What's the next one? Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, okay, here's one called My Grandpa's Death. You don't have to say my username since it's long and fucking weird, but you can if you want. Anyway, my name's Nicholas, and I'm 13. I'm going into 8th grade this year. I don't care about grammar, so I'm not going to use any. But I lived in... Placerville, California until third grade and my grandpa on my stepdad's side was my best friend until I moved until my family moved when I was in third grade and when I was in fourth grade my grandpa developed lung cancer 
and my family didn't want me to know, so they didn't tell me, and I didn't know until he died, so I never got to properly say goodbye, and my stepdad didn't know until five months before he died, so me and my stepdad were torn about it, so we would call his number to listen to his voicemail until when I was in sixth grade when his wife gave the number to her brother-in-law, and we haven't talked to her since. Also, I might write another email about my school shooting when I was in first or second grade. I forgot to say it because of it and the shooting i feel very depressed but i don't have a therapist but my turtle and my dogs feel like therapy animals for me okay that's that e <laughs> that's that email he wasn't kidding about not using grammar that was all one run on sentence good job Let's move on to Mr. S.E. Mr. S.E. writes, When I was seven, my mother went to a mental hospital for a year or two. We always lived remotely, so I never really had many friends my own age, and my father was often busy with work trying to support us. So much so that the only times we'd really spend quality time together with him was during birthdays or Christmas. Of course, those who took care of us during those years never really explained why she was ill and how to cope with her absence and after deal with her illness. So when she came back, instead of being happy and bubbly, she was all depressed and weepy and sometimes hysterical and inconsolable, and we were just kind of left to deal with it. Our father, still the sole breadwinner, was still was ever working. Of course, she was very introverted, gloomy, and weepy most days. Sometimes she'd get so upset she'd just cry. Uh, sit and cry, and we'd try to cheer her up, but it never really seemed to fix much for long. Eventually, I grew apathetic and stopped really trying to make her feel better, which is when the guilt began and is something I still can't shake. Because I feel like I should care and maybe even want to, I don't know, but even by the age of 12, half my life ago, I was just so tired, so fed up of trying to make her feel better, and as a result, riddled with guilt, that I couldn't put on a brave smile and do the easy thing and just shutting, shutting her up by saying something nice to lift her spirits. Her illness continued to plague her. My father, during the hours he was actually around, grew weary of her too, so much so that he started to get ill as well and was given antidepressants. Around this time, they started arguing a lot and inevitably split up, leaving me and my brother with our mother. The result for this pressure seemed to cause me to regress, and I floated through the next seven years of life like an uh, automa automaton? A automaton. Like an auton automaton. Uh, and lacking any interpersonal skills. I had no idea how to make friends. It wasn't until I left high school and started listening to music that it felt like a spell was broken. Like, for the first moment in a long time, I had this sense of self-awareness, but now that my emotional development was so far behind everyone else... I felt like I was racing to catch up with people who had actually spent the last several years becoming adults. Around that time, I actually started becoming depressed myself. Mental illness seems to be a hereditary thing on my mother's side and shut myself in, a, in my room for two years. It's something I still struggle with now. Sometimes it lapses and I get everything together, but then every few months a black hand from the void seems to reach out no matter how high I am on life and pulls me back into a bad mood that seems to last almost as long as the highs. During these periods, I end up either binge eating or binge drinking to try and ease my mood, which really just seems to exas exasper exasperate the problem. Even outside the depression and even during good periods, though, I still struggle with anxiety. That first began, as you'd imagined, around the time my mother became ill and I had to go to the hospital. One of them is social anxiety which binds me so much that even when people do as I hope and talk to me in leisurely slash fairly relaxed environments, even if it's one-to-one, -one, my first and only prevailing thought is that I have to get away, that I have to leave here now, and when I finally manage to make an exit, I do all I can to limit or avoid future or further interactions with them, sometimes even avoiding where they are as long as possible so they won't talk to me. 
This makes my work, which already has a somewhat limited level of interaction, an uncomfortable experience some days. The other anxiety is the one I referred to as beginning when my mother went to the hospital. It's like I don't really know how to describe it other than this, like fear. Like it's something that evolves as my current fears slash sources of anxiety change, but for a long time it revolved around being alone or the unknown and that something would just come out of the void and get me. As I grew older, it became a fear of sleeping while I was alone in the house, something I still struggle with a bit, in case someone came in and stabbed me. More recently, I've been scared that if I get an eyelash when I rub my eye, since eyelashes are supposed to give you wishes if you blow them away, that I'll accidentally wish for something bad to happen, like the sun to burn out, or for the world to end, or for the sun to engulf the earth and kill us all, or for a black hole to swallow the earth, or the sun, or that I'll accidentally wish to be terminally ill, and because I struggle with intrusive thoughts, sometimes I accidentally think when I'm supposed to be making the wish that I know I have to make because the wish follows you around, you know, like it just happens, so you have to be careful and use it up on something that isn't dangerous. And when I do accidentally think it, I have to either tell someone so the wish won't come true, because you know, like, when you make a wish, you have to keep it a secret or it won't come true. Well, usually I just kind of freeze up and start thinking, I wish for my wish to not come true, and stuff like that, so that I won't accidentally make something horrible happen. And then, like, sometimes I worry that if I just think about a black hole hard enough, that one will appear and tear us all apart, or that if I look at the sun, it might get devoured or turn into a supernova. And then the depression just makes it all worse because it latches onto my current biggest fear and seems to throw it in my face. Like for a long time, all I could think about was how I was going to die. And then it was about my heart and this constant fear that I would have a heart attack. And now all I can think is about global warming and how the sea levels will rise and the land will grow a rid and life will become increasingly shit for those of us on the bottom till we die. And most people would, perhaps naturally, as part of their psychological defense mechanism, just kind of bury it in the same way that a person buries existential thoughts, like the fear that ebbs away just be uh, the fear that ebbs away because the mind needs to deflect from the strain. Except on the bad days, those fears linger, making it impossible to actually feel anything but terror. You're the first person I've really conveyed this to in detail, by the way. Like, I don't know why, but unlike depression, talking about these fears and anxieties is really hard. Like, even when I was alone with a psychologist for, for multiple hour sessions, I could never really, I could never manage to really bring myself to convey the, this things. I think what makes it easier is that I could be anyone right now, so I don't have to face you after this. And of course, naturally, I'm incredibly lonely too. Part of it is down to the fact that I suck at communicating and also fear people and fear getting close to people, thanks to my mother, since I fear that stress, since I fear the stress that will come if I'm obliged to help them as I attempted to help my mother. And because of that stress, I have a deep yearning for the parental warmth that I received a little of from my father and took a little from my mother. She tried to provide it, but our relationship, as you would imagine, became incredibly strained to the point that I feel no emotion towards her at all. So every time I see a girl, all I can think is how much I want to give her, I want her to give me the same emotional warmth that I should have derived from my mother. I want to so badly be able to sink into someone's arms and for them to nurse my wounds and tell me everything will be okay and to listen to all my concerns and worries and thoughts without judgment and love me unconditionally all the while. And it's all I can think when I get near a girl, how much I crave that. I fear perhaps that I crave it so much that it may even make me dissatisfied with the relationships I currently have from time to time. Those relationships, of course, always seem one-sided too. People seem to regard me as a friend, I think, but yet I derive no other value from them other than to alleviate the loneliness for a bit. It doesn't at all fill me with a warmth uh, at all, and yet I can't shake this feeling that it is impossible to, to derive a sense of comfort and bliss from close relationships and to feel close to someone, as if they complete a part of you, but it feels like something I'm no longer capable of accessing. Of accessing. You know, as if someone had blocked off some hose pipe in my head. Or to use a shitty analogy, since you said you liked Naruto, right? It's like, I don't know, a feeling I can only com really compare to someone blocking your chakra points. 
like, you know, something should flow, in this case, some kind of comfort, happiness, warmth, affection, but it isn't. It's like a faulty circuit. Anyway, I'm sorry for sending you such a long email. Thanks for your time, man. And that's the end of that email. That was a long one. Okay. Um, I'll do one more. I'll do one more and then go to bed. Okay, here's one from Gray Notes. After hearing all these stories in the chamber, I want to share what I do and have done to try to be happy. Just some background, a couple of years ago, my best friend disappeared and all my few other friends had either died or disappeared as well. I was very isolated before I knew any of them like three years ago, and they didn't have many friends either. I'm 18 now, by the way. I think people who can openly share their history on the internet must be fairly open-minded, so I would like to share my idea. In my experience, genuinely helping other people is the best treatment for any bad emotion. The rest of this email is trying to explain what that means. Genuine help for another person is assisting them to gain a lasting happiness. So helping someone, into, uh, so helping someone get into smoking meth doesn't count. Help could be physical, helping a new neighbor move in, or mental, teaching them about something. I suppose a logic behind would be, I help you, you help me. A lasting happiness is something hard to describe. Happiness is when you don't need to analyze happiness because you know what it is and that it is good and you have it. No questioning. If you think that your attempts to help only harm people, all you need to do is try. Try to help and, if, and you will. You may not be helped in return directly, but something good does happen. Harming others only happens when you stop caring. If you think that you can't try or care, why you, why are you listening to this podcast? It surely takes some effort to listen to an hour of other people's misery. If you can spend effort empathizing with people over the internet, you can help by offering your hand or your perspective. Now, if you think that other people are the source of your problems, you're probably right. Who were the source of their problems? Other people, probably. The world isn't completely terrible, though. Those mystical people Mumket mentioned in his depression review are actually happy. If those people, who probably wouldn't listen to most of you, are happy, you can find happiness as well. At least I hope. Hasn't worked for me yet. LOL, kill me. And that's the end of that... Um, that tongue twister, confusing labyrinth of an email. If you guys got something out of that, then <laughs> good job, because I, I don't really know what he was trying to say. Okay, folks, uh, it's been fun. I don't, I don't know how long we went. The thing doesn't tell me. How long does it say I've gone? Oh, I've, I've gone for about 48 minutes, so close enough to an hour. All right, folks, get some sleep. Or, or stay up all night jerking off. Whatever makes you happy. Or I guess whatever makes you miserable. It's up to you. Uh, I'll do these uh, probably again sometime. It probably won't take another nine months to, to do the next one. Who knows? Adios, folks.